everyone. Thank you so much for attending this evening. My name is Sarah and I will be facilitating the conversation today. Um, as you are watching live via YouTube, please feel free to ask any questions in the chat and hopefully we will be able to answer some of them at the end of the presentation. Um, we are joined by two presenters today who I'll introduce in just a second. Um, and they will be answering the Q&As that you provided in the registration for this event. Um, and that will be towards the end of the presentation. Today's video will be recorded and it will be saved on uh, Peterborough Public Health's YouTube channel. It will also be on the RAT webpage of Peterborough Public Health and all of that will be linked at the end of the presentation. So I'm going to start with a land acknowledgement. Um, I am meeting with you virtually today from Nagojiwanong or Peterborough, Ontario, and I respectfully acknowledge that I am on the Treaty 20 and traditional territory of the Mich Mississauga and Anishinaabeg nations. We offer our gratitude to the First Nations and for their care and teachings about our earth and our relations. May we honor those teachings. Now to move on to our speakers, we're so happy to be joined today by Dr. Sarah Jamieson. Um, Dr. Jamieson is an assistant professor in the biology department at Trent University, and her research focuses on urban ecology in Peterborough. This summer, she and her students are researching scavenger behavior, nesting habits of robins, and how gardening may influence moth populations. We're also joined by Matt Ferris today. Matt is a health inspector with Peterborough Public Health and has been with us since 2012. He's currently working as a senior inspector with areas of focus on food safety, rabies prevention, recreational water, drinking water, and health hazards. So we're going to start off with Sarah's presentation. Take it away. Okay, hi everyone. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, so yeah, so today basically I'm going to talk more about the ecology of rats and give you some background on rats themselves. And then um, once I finish up, Matt's going to take over and talk more on the um, the health <laughs> things that people might want to be considering. All right, just a little tech look. Okay, um, so <laughs> now it works. Sorry guys, it's just uh, gotten really small. Um, Sarah, are you gonna be able to just forward it for me? Absolutely. Okay. Stop, no, no. Okay, yeah, there we go. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about um, brown rats. You also call them Norway rats. You'll hear all sorts of descriptions, um, but brown rats or Norway rats are kind of the most common ones. Um, so <laughs> they're not actually from Norway. Um, their native range is China and Mongolia. And so um, they came over from there. Could you click? Um, and basically, they really started traveling with the global trade. So once um, they colonized Europe in the 1500s, and then once they hit there, they basically traveled with all the European exploration. So they hit North America in the 1750s. Now they're pretty much found throughout North America, except some of the really, um, you know, like northern Alaska and some of the islands up in our Arctic, um, except Alberta. So Alberta hasn't had a... Um, a population since the 1950s and that's basically been they um they put in a massive effort into controlling the, um the populations uh, they're relatively large compared to you know your average little rodent so from tip to tail they're about 40 centimeters so just over a foot and a bit um and they can be generally between 200 up to 400 grams so um just approaching a, the one pound hit uh in the wild they live about a year right so you know again it kind of depends on a lot of factors but um years kind of average okay next slide sir okay so females they can start breeding <laughs> at two months of age right so um generally in the wild it's thought it's more around three months but still it's really really young okay um, they have their first litter tends to be smaller than the average litter. So the um, first litter tends to be around six uh, pups. And then after that, it's eight pups per litter. The thing is, though, they can also have up to six litters a year. So that's, 
you know, on average, the one female here, when she starts breeding at two year, two months of age, um, she can produce up to 46 offspring. <laughs> now, you might have seen this figure going around, uh, the one that just came up and you know, it talks about how within three years, from if you have two rats, you can have up to almost half a billion. Um, that is mathematically correct, <laughs> um, but ecologically, um, there's so many factors that would prevent that from happening, right? Um, particularly density dependent things like, you know, basically they'd start fighting, there'd be competition for food, um, cannibalism at that stage, so all sorts of things. So that would really be, um, you know, ideal conditions with no predation, limited disease, all that kind of thing. So while mathematically it works out, it's not um, kind of ecologically um, of concern. <laughs> all right, Sarah? Uh, movement wise, so it's a little bit tough. So generally they stay within 200 meters, okay? So there's been a lot of research that's happened in um, Vancouver. They have the uh, um, or Raku uh, Vancouver rat project there um, and they've followed them. So 200 meters is not actually that much. So this little figure that I have here, um, that little mouse is sitting on uh, City Hall. And that shows you what 200 meters around City Hall is, okay? So it's not that far. Um, and then things like streets actually act, act as barriers. So while rats, you know, obviously can run across the street, they, they don't like to, right? So if they have everything that they need within their block, you know, so they don't have to travel across streets, they, they generally won't. Okay, so, which is why maybe, you know, neighbors across the street from you might be having a rat problem and yet you don't see them because the rats just don't really want to be crossing those streets. Um, once you have a really dense colony, they actually move less, um, partially because, you know, they have everything that they need there. And also there might be competition between colonies. Um, one big thing is, so also they're primarily nocturnal. So the majority of their act activities happen um, before midnight. So it's not just nocturnal, it's kind of like early bird nocturnal. So really it's, you know, dusk to midnight is their main time of activity. And then after that, um, it kind of gets less and less visible. That is saying though, if it's a female who's lactating, you know, so producing milk and, you know, has a whole bunch of pups to be caring for, you might see her during the day because basically it's the same as raccoons and skunks. If they're caring for young, they just have to eat regardless of what time of day it is. So the, those of you that are parents out there, I'm sure, you know, you've had many in, uh, middle of the night feeds. So same deal there, except it's middle of the day feeds. Okay, next. Um, densities, well, <laughs> it really depends. So it depends on the location. So sometimes the density can remain fairly constant throughout the year, but if you do get peaks, it's generally late summer, early fall. And that's really where we're getting a lot of juveniles starting to move around and also a lot of like high juvenile or, or uh, survivorship, right? Because it is kind of a good period of time and you'll have a lot of offspring surviving compared to say winter breeding. Okay, now this was a study that was conducted in New York City and they found that densities were positive related to green spaces. So being near parks or um, just even like, you know, little center parts of cul-de-sacs, things like that can um, boost rat numbers. And that's partially because it kind of provo provides a good soil for them to be burrowing around in and, and having their little colonies. Um, also density of restaurants, <laughs> uh, you know, basically that just provides access to food, okay? Um, older houses and vacant housing um, can also lead to higher uh, numbers. Um, and, you know, Matt's gonna get into this as well, but those types of, of homes, basically often they have easy ways of access for the rats. And once the rats kind of um, get in there, um, they settle, right? So especially in a vacant home, uh, they, they settle and nobody's going to bother them. Also, um, areas with high density or lower income residences also tend to have more rats. Um, and again, you know, I often hear people like, oh, my neighbor just took down his shed and now we have rats everywhere. And it's like, well, that's because it was a nice, quiet place for them to, to burrow under and um, basically <laughs> chill out. <laughs> um, and then when you have residential attractions, so this was more of a look like the New York study was more of like a, a, a neighborhood type study. Residential attractions, compost, of course, does provide uh, some food resources for um, rats. So that will lead to them. water features. So, you know, having your little backyard pond or even fountains or 
um, bird feeders that are low to the ground, right? Everybody needs food, water, and shelter. So that's, you know, they're providing that. And also feeding of wildlife and or um, cats, right? So cat colonies and such. Um, so bird, you know, feeding birds, cats, raccoons, whatever. Anytime you're putting food out into the landscape, um, there's a chance you're bringing in rats or, or providing for rats. Okay, next. So that being said, um, in urban cities, right, you often have um, increased body condition of rats, right? So that can lead to increased reproductive rates and or increased survival, right? So they'll have more babies and they're likely to survive longer. And so that ultimately can lead to um, increased densities. And the thing is, once you have an increased density, right, there's only so high a density you can get before um, aggressive interactions start occurring, right? So when you have high densities, it's not just that um, they're next to each other and they're able to share germs, they actually start getting more aggressive. And these uh, aggressive interactions, if you have one sick or carrier individual in that, um, that colony, it'll be more likely to spread it because they're, you know, aggressively interacting, scratching, biting, all that kind of stuff. Um, okay, uh, and then I think that the key here, and I think if you hit the button again there, Sarah, is the keyword is can, right? So these are, are um, you know, it's not a guarantee that, that that will all lead that way, but uh, it's a can kind of thing, okay? So <laughs> we often hear, you know, Peter Rose infested with rats and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I, I do occasionally see rats, um, but I definitely wouldn't call it infested. So, you know, there are um, data out there of, you know, how many calls uh, professional um, uh, uh, pest controllers get. We're not high on that list at all. OK, um, and then so my research uh, involves using camera traps. So basically, like they're little cameras that we put out into the environment. Um, sometimes we bait them, sometimes we don't. And basically, um, the camera takes a picture whenever it sees movement. Okay, So I had my urban ecology class, so it's a fourth year biology class. They were pretty much scattered throughout uh, Peterborough, and they all took home one of my cameras for the week. And they all <laughs> set it up in their backyard, and halfway through they baited it with an apple, and the other half it was unbaited. Um, so we had 25 cameras placed in September and we had 204 or 284 pictures taken and zero rats. And I thought this was really good because, you know, some of my other research, it kind of ends up selecting certain people and all this kind of stuff. But this was really a nice wide swatch of Peterborough um, and we had no rats. So that was great. Um, one of the other studies that um, I'm leading is with a master's student, Emma Byers, and we look at so we're looking at window strikes. So when birds hit windows and they, they die, um, we're looking at what kind of species might be scavenging those. Um, so our, our research involves taking um, birds that are already dead. We got them through the Kortha uh, Wildlife Center and we place them under windows and leave them for a week with these cameras focused on them. And out of these 136 species, or bird carcasses out there, only two were scavenged by rats. So um, again, not not much evidence for being infested and then we also had a lot of photos of um, species that didn't actually scavenge the birds so we had 270 um, non-scavenging um, events um, and only three of those were rats so again we would have expected a lot more if we were infested and this is again a uh, pretty widespread throughout you know we have down south and north and you know east city all that kind of stuff so we're, we're fairly um, geographically covered so I would say, no, we're not infested, but that doesn't mean that they're not problem areas, right? Because as I said, they don't move much. So you could have a block that you might want to use the term infested, but generally the town itself, no. Okay, Sarah. Okay, so um, other comments that I've had, you know, just a couple of years ago, Peterborough enacted the um, roaming cat bylaw, so which makes it illegal to have your cat um, roaming off your property. Um, so basically everybody's supposed to be either keeping their cats inside or keeping them on a leash. So similar, you know, what we should be doing with our dogs. Um, and so people thought that maybe by enacting this bylaw, you know, we're removing some predators from the landscape, which is, you know, leading to a boost in rat numbers. Um, so, <laughs> 
Do cats eat rats? Well, yeah, sure they do. Of course they do, right? But relatively small numbers. So there was a study done in Baltimore, and they found that less than 7% of cat scats, so cat, you know, fecal um, samples, contain evidence of rats. All right, so that, that's really actually quite low. Um, and then they found in suburban and um, suburban areas, it was anywhere between 75 and 80, or 75 and 100 percent of the scat actually included native species. So this, to me, definitely presents um, evidence that the cat bylaw was a good thing. Um, also, when the cats are preying upon rats, they tend to be going after the young ones, right? Um, you know, for a lot of different reasons, they're probably out uh, more easily accessed by these cats. And these are the non-breeders, right? So they're not the ones we need to be taking out. We need to be taking out the breeders, okay? Um, so my conclusion is this is very unlikely that the cat bylaw had any effect on rat populations. Okay, Sarah? Okay. Um, and, you know, there's also a lot of discussion about our new composting or green bin initiative, um, which I'm, I'm pretty excited about. Um, so do rats eat compost? Well, yes, of course they do. It's free food, right? And, you know, often it's the meal we just had. So it's, you know, nice and fresh and delicious and cooked. Um, but I, you know, generally composters don't cause a rat infestation, okay? Um, they definitely, you know, they do feed on it. So this little picture here um, at the base of that one, you could see in a little burrow that the, the rat has done. But when you look at the research, it doesn't suggest that it's, it is a big factor. So there was a study done by a honors student up in, the, in uh, Laurentian University, and she found that, so she basically ended up sampling all these different households that um, whether or not they compost or they don't compost, whether or not they've been seeing rats and, and or haven't been. And she found that um, the houses that did compost, only 33% of them reported that they had seen rats. And that was compared to 49% of the respondents who don't compost. So 49% of the people who don't compost had commented that they do see rats, right? So, um, you know, good evidence there. And then there was an, an Austrian study that looked at um, green pro, green bin programs, and they actually found that they did inde indeed actually reduce the numbers, right? So yes, we will be composting, but um, they're going to be contained in containers. People will not be putting, hopefully, <laughs> the compost out in their garbage bags, which will would be easier, more easily accessed, right? Um, also, for those of us like myself who compost just for the fact I want to be keeping it out of the landfill, um, this is great because no, I will no longer need to be storing compost in my garden. I'll be putting it in these green bins and having it picked up regularly. Okay, next. So that's it for me and leaning into uh, the public health side of things for Matt. Um, what do people what did people say when they caught the black pit plague? Go ahead, Sarah. Oh, rat. Oh, rat. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'll be sticking around. So if anybody has any ecology type questions, I'll be here as well. So I'll leave it to you, Matt. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Jameson. I Bye. will Bye. hand it over to Matt Ferris. Thank you. Okay. I'm trying to go through the slides. Can anybody? Uh, Okay, that seems to be working. Okay, so uh, yeah, my name is Matt Ferris. I'm a health inspector with Peterborough Public Health. I'm here to go through uh, my part of the presentation. So rats, concerns, and controls. Uh, for the agenda, uh, I'm going to review uh, kind of common concerns associated uh, with rats, uh, things that you can do to prevent and control an issue, and uh, the role of Peterborough Public Health when it comes to uh, rat and rodent issues. And just a quick disclaimer uh, that this uh, presentation is meant to provide general information, uh, practical solutions to prevent control rat issues. It's not intended to function as legal advice for any specific ongoing legal disputes. Had to say that. Okay, so health concerns. Uh, zooming out, looking at uh, what what is the health concern? Any kind of disease that's spread from an animal to a human is called a zoonotic disease. 
Um, this is not a new thing that people have been dealing with. Uh, it's been something that us humans have been dealing with for the past 12,000 years, ever since we started farming and living in permanent settlements. It's how many diseases come from animals? It's estimated roughly 60% of all known infectious diseases. Um, and up to 75% of all new and emerging infectious diseases uh, have find their origin uh, in animals. It's not just rats, uh, mosquitoes, fleas, ticks, bats, mice, birds, cats, dogs. Um, they can all, all spread disease. Uh, rats were implicated uh, in the biggest, most deadly pandemic uh, of all time, which was uh, the bubonic plague, the the Black Death, it wiped out half of Europe. Um, and this was uh, due to a flea that was carried on the rats and the flea was able to deliver bites to people and deliver bacteria to people through those bites. Um, so is plague something that we need to be worried about in Ontario? Um, no, it's really not. Um, so it's been a reportable disease since uh, about 1930. The last reported case in Ontario was 1939. Uh, leptospirosis. This is uh, a bacterial disease that spread through the urine of infected animals, including rats, and it most typically spreads through water. Um, and uh, a common way to get ill with this bacteria is to go swimming in polluted water or go swimming after very heavy rains. I uh, wasn't able to find specific stats on this one. Uh, it's not a reportable disease in Ontario. Um, but all I could find is that human cases in Canada period are very rare. Uh, however, we do know this bacteria exists in, in Ontario, Southern Ontario specifically, and we're seeing cases go up in uh, dogs. Hantavirus uh, this is viral disease spread through uh, dried urine, feces, saliva of rodents, specifically deer mice. And uh, this can get into your lungs when you're cleaning up a mess. Uh, very serious illness. Um, are you likely to get this in Ontario? Uh, it's been reportable since 2001 and there hasn't been any reported cases. There will be a first one at some point, um, but just the chances aren't overwhelming. Uh, and then salmonellosis, uh, so salmonella bacteria that we, we normally think of chicken, we normally think of food, but a lot of different animals carry this bacteria in their gut. And so if a, a rat finds its way into your food supply, leaves behind some of its feces that contains salmonella, it can create uh, salmonellosis in yourself, uh, lots of diarrhea, lots of feeling awful. So in addition to being able to spread disease, uh, rats are also quite destructive if they get to high numbers. So um, is this the point in the presentation where uh, where everybody should be panicking? Uh, no, I'm having a hard time here <laughs> moving the slides forward. Sarah, I might need you to uh, take over the slideshow. Can do. Awesome. And if you could go back a couple of slides. Perfect. OK, so next slide. Uh, this is not the point in the presentation where you need to panic, even though I just panicked uh, due to technical difficulties. We don't need to, to panic about uh, seeing a rat outside. There's very clear steps that you can take. So what you want to do is one, you want to confirm, is it actually a rat? Uh, issue that you're having. Next, you want to clean up any kind of mess that they've made. After that, you want to remove what's attracting them. So clutter, food, water sources. Then you want to block them out of your home or your business. And finally, contact licensed pest control. So first of all, looking at evidence. OK, so we have rat droppings down there. Uh, they can be quite big. They tend to be um, have blunt ends, so with a mouse dropping, uh, pointy ends, but rat droppings can be big. Um, they can be up to two centimeters long for a full grown big rat. Um, so big noticeable droppings.
Next thing you might see, uh, burrows. And these burrows do look uh, somewhat similar like to a chipmunk burrow. Um, these burrows are usually two to three inches in diameter at the opening. Uh, they're usually one to two feet underground, but they can go much, much deeper. And depending on how many rats they, there are, um, they can start building burrows on top of each other. It can create very unstable land. So that's something that we're, we're very concerned with. Evidence uh, gnaw marks. So you're seeing parallel tooth marks, usually about uh, three millimeters long. It was very clear there. Um, the next picture is not quite so clear. So harder to tell what it is in wood, um, but this would be signs of some kind of likely rodent issue. And then this one, um, smudge marks. <clears throat> so if you've ever seen, if you have a, if you suspect rats and you see very dark brown kind of area, it, it could be what's referred to as a smudge mark, which is uh, a high traffic area for rodents. They're running through this path over and over and over again. And this is just buildup from the grease on their coats that's being left behind. Uh, you might even see if you have uh, a rat issue in your backyard, you might be able to see uh, a, a trail of grass that's no longer existent where rats are going from their burrow to the food, to the burrow, back and forth. And then of course, uh, if you see a rat, um, so seeing one rat, uh, it's not indicative of there being a, an issue, um, but if you're seeing a bunch of rats, especially during the day, that's indicative of uh, there's a lot of rats in the area and we obviously want to take, take action. So you've confirmed that there is an issue. Uh, you've found, say, uh, a nest or you've set up a snap trap and you've caught a rat. Uh, you find droppings. We want to treat any rodent mess as if it were infectious. So we want to use the wet method to clean it up, which is basically spraying the rat down, uh, if it's a dead rat, uh, nest, droppings, urine, whatever it is, spraying it down, household disinfectant would work. Uh, you could even use uh, like a teaspoon of chlorine bleach added to a liter of water, really mist the surface down, let it sit for a minute, wipe it up, put it into a bag, throw it in the garbage, uh, wash your hands afterwards. And um, to really protect yourself, we'd recommend wearing a mask when you're cleaning up any kind of uh, rodent mess feces. Uh, mask, gloves, and if you have one available, N95 is the recommendation for the mask. So next, you really have to think about, you cleaned up the mess, you know you got rats, uh, you try to figure out what is attracting the rats. And um, compost bin, um, as Sarah mentioned earlier, um, Compost bins can provide food and shelter and yeah, they're cozy places for a rat. So you're trying to think, um, if I were a rat, what would appeal to me? Compost bin, great. So what can you do with the compost bin? Uh, rats, they're used to being prey. They're used to being preyed upon by other animals. So what you can do, you can move the compost bin away from a fence, away from other walls. Rats, other rodents, they usually like to stay along walls. It provides some kind of cover or fence lines. If you can move, move the compost bin away from the structure, that help. Uh, you can get hardware cloth, put it underneath the bin uh, and around the bin. This can help prevent rats from getting in. Uh, when you put food in there, cover it up. Avoid putting food like bread and pasta, meat, dairy, oils, all that stuff in there. Rats love all that stuff just like we do. And uh, if none of that's working, uh, consider using a, a drum composter if you still really want to be composting uh, in your backyard. Then could also be something like, uh, say you have bird feed, a bag of bird feed in your garage just sitting on the sitting on the ground. That's really easy food for any kind of rodent. Um, are your garbage bins secure? Do you have a whole bunch of bird feeders that are overflowing? Or is there, where's the water source? Like where are the rats getting their water? You're trying to really figure out in your yard what's attracting the rats. Next, please. Uh, the other thing, uh, yeah, you want to remove clutter. 
keep a, a neat and tidy looking yard, uh, remove piles of brush and yard waste or remove uh, construction materials if you just had a project done. Keep piles of firewood off of the ground and just keep in mind rats, they usually want to stay close to cover of walls and fences, so be particularly mindful of those areas to remove clutter from, from those. Uh, next, what you want to do is you want to walk around your house or your business. Um, and you want to look for any kind of hole, um, any kind of holes in the foundation um, or any kind of gap underneath a, a door that could permit rat or a mouse to run in. So rats can fit in a pretty tight, tight area. They can fit in a hole about a, a quarter in diameter's uh, size. Mice can fit into holes as small as a dime. So recommend go around. You're just looking for possible ways that uh, a mouse or a rat could get into your house. And a very effective, very cheap way to, to keep them out is to use steel wool and just kind of jam it in those holes. Um, if you want to use steel wool with some caulking, that could help it stay in there. Um, so you want to do that all around. Look for any kind of pipes going into your house. Um, even if it's a really small little gap, you want to fill it in with the uh, steel wool. I guess, and after you've gone around, you've done the outside of your house, now it's a good time to go inside. Um, and especially uh, if you're concerned with rats, they would typically come in through the basement, um, through digging down, um, or they could come in on the main level. So you want to be looking around, is there any possible spot that a rat could come in here? And you want to take the steel wool and fill those gaps. Next, please. Um, and then finally, so snap traps uh, can be very effective, uh, especially along walls. Um, and uh, it's recommended that you put them out only at night. Um, but the, the bad thing with snap traps is that if you put them out in the day, they can catch birds, uh, they can catch chipmunks, other animals that you don't want it to catch. Um, so if you're going to put one uh, outside, just evening only, and uh, but it's great for something like a garage. Um, you shouldn't have a, a whole bunch of other animals running in there. Um, there's traps like glue traps, um, they can very inhumane, so not rec recommended. And uh, when it comes to poison, we just have to treat that as a last resort. Uh, one, rats can develop immunity to poison and uh, the rat eats the poison, it kills the rat, and then something else comes down and eats the rat, whether it be an owl or a hawk, and then it can also kill that animal. So there tends to be collateral damage uh, when using uh, poison. Um, and just if you think about it, it how much rat poison there is and how much rat poison people try to use. If that was the solution, there would not be 7 billion rats. There's roughly 7 billion rats in the world uh, all over the place. Um, so we really have to stick with those annoying four things that are not the easiest things to do, but trying to figure out uh, what's attracting them to your property, removing those things and blocking them from entering your house. There's a lot of pest control companies in and around Peterborough, and we, we recommend that you reach out to a professional. They can always come to your house. They'll do everything that we just talked about here. Try to identify what's attracting them, what's letting them in. So the role of Peterborough Public Health. It really depends on the setting where there is a rodent issue. Um, if the rodent issue is linked to a food premise, it's very easy for us to look at that and say there's a real potential public health threat here. We also have uh, a regulation that we can enforce, the food premises regulation. Say we went into a food premise and we saw there's a serious issue, nothing's being done to control the rat issue. We're actually concerned that the food is getting contaminated, we can do an immediate closure under the Health Protection and Promotion Act if it's severe. Um, so we do have uh, uh, legal methods to deal with rats very uh, easily for the most part in food premises. It's not so easy uh, when it comes to private 
residences. So if a uh, rodent issue is li linked to a private residence, say it's a homeowner um, and they're concerned they saw a rat, uh, our primary role there is to provide education to that homeowner. If the rodent issue is linked to a rental unit, um, we work with the tenant. Uh, we often first thing is tell the tenant to reach out to the landlord. That's the first thing they have to do. We give the tenant some practical advice about what they can do to uh, minimize the issue. Uh, ultimately, if the landlord is not addressing the issue, we can we can get in there. We can try to force them. Um, but really, it's the city of Peterborough. They have bylaws that do speak specifically to this, uh, and we can work with the city of Peterborough to help uh, get it done as the property standard bylaws and the property maintenance bylaws specifically speak to rodents. So we really do have to look like, is the situation posing a public health threat? And I know that for a lot of people, seeing a rat is very mentally uh, distressing. But in most instances, rats are not likely to uh, negatively uh, impact your health. They are part of the natural environment now. They're everywhere. That's not to say that you should be inviting them into your restaurant or business or your property, um, because if they do get in, they can cause a lot of lot of damage whether it be contaminating your food supply, chewing concrete, metal, uh, chewing through wires. So really do need to take it seriously. It all comes back to this effective control. The more of these prevention methods you can do, the better. Uh, so yeah, you want to safely clean up using the wet method, wear gloves and a mask, remove clutter, food and water sources, do everything you can to block them out contact licensed pest control, and that's likely to help your situation out. OK, and now we'll get into the questions. OK, so I will take the first one. Uh, what can Peterborough Public Health do about rats, roaches and bed bugs in apartments? So for the most part, it would come down to education would be our typical role, uh, especially for uh, cockroaches and bed bugs in an apartment setting. Um, we can work with the tenant, we can speak with the landlord, but when it comes to ordering things to be done, um, in many instances, it'll be easier to go through the city. The city does have a complaint form on their website and there are two bylaws uh, within the city of Peterborough that specifically speak to this. If it were something like a rat issue that the landlord uh, is is not willing to uh, work on, um, we would become involved and we would uh, work with uh, our friends at the city. Question number two, I don't know, Sarah, if you could take this one. Um, I'll just read the question out. Uh, we have rats in our compost and they try to come into the house, but we feel that keeping food out of landfill, landfills, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions is important. How much of the rat problem is due to backyard compost? Do you expect the situation will improve once we have the green bin program in place in the fall? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I touched off it a little bit, but yeah, I mean, they definitely do eat um, compost. Right. Um, I don't again, I don't think it's a big problem, but there are ways of controlling it. Um, like Matt was talking about, like I have chicken wire under mine, um, my composter. It's buried down. There's no way for them to I have chicken wire, then rocks <laughs> and then my composter. Um, you can also get um, like the the um, raised ones that you know have the twisters. There's also the um, uh, Green Up has some ones that have uh, no access at all, like we, that, we got that kind. And so those, you really can use those and eliminate the problem. Um, I do think that the green bin problem or the green bin program will actually help um, because, you know, some people compost, with, you know, to assist with their gardening, but other people like myself and the, the person who asked the question, you know, we do it trying to, you know, um, you know, just better for the, pro the world. And so, you know, being able to have my compost removed from my property on a weekly basis is going to be amazing. Um, and again, 
it's going to be um, it's it's a better way of storing food waste um, than garbage bags, right? If people are concerned about having in their compost sitting out there for a week or or whatnot, um, you know, if you have the space in your freezer, that's what I mean, we do with our bones and stuff. We just put it in a plastic bag and then freeze it for the week, and then we just you know um, put that at the end of the week, um, so you can remove that issue as well. But generally, I don't think it's uh, causes the problem. It definitely, um, you know, does feed rats, um, but there are ways to mitigate those those risks. Um, and I do think that the Green Bin program is going to be amazing. <laughs> so I'm pretty, uh, yeah. And when, when I told my students in uh, urban ecology about it, there was literally a whoop, like everybody was so excited to hear it because they realized what a big step it is for the city. So um, yeah, I think it will help. Thanks, Sarah. And uh, I'll take the next question. And I believe this was um, uh, coming from somebody renting an apartment. Um, they made a their comment was they killed five large rats now that have come under their kitchen sink. One made it into the main living space. We try to keep things clean and tidy. Today I saw one outside that went into our rain drain pipe. Could the rats living here be causing um, some of our health problems? Um, and I wouldn't want to speculate on um, what could be causing your health problems, but I would strongly recommend if you haven't already, immediately reach out uh, to your landlord if there's ongoing health problems that are unexplained, uh, reach out to your doctor. Um, and also, if if this is a situation that you've been trying to fix with your with your landlord, um, let us know. We can we can try to help you out. Um, ultimately, uh, I would recommend as well going to the the city's website, the property standards. They do have a complaint form, and you can uh, put in a complaint with the city. We could assist with that as well. So yeah, call call if you wanted to get pointed in the right direction. Seven zero five seven four three one thousand. Uh, what can be done about people deliberately feeding rats in their backyard? And this is another one where we'll we'll try to educate. Um, really, this is something people don't like to have these uncomfortable conversations with their neighbors. Um, but it's going to be much better if you have that uncomfortable conversation than if somebody from the city ends up being the first person to bring it to their attention or somebody from the health unit. They're probably going to figure out, even though we're careful not to say anything, who made the complaint. So uh, speak with your neighbors about this kind of thing. Um, if if the neighbor is just totally unwilling um, to stop feeding and they're attracting rats to the area, I would recommend that you put in again uh, with the city of Peterborough uh, uh, a complaint, property standards complaint. Our, our primary role there is, is education. Right. So there are no questions on the YouTube feed. So I think that concludes our evening. Thank you to Dr. Jameson and Matt Fair who have joined us tonight. Really appreciate your uh, wisdom with respect to this topic. Um, and as I mentioned before, the recording will be on our YouTube page. It will also be on uh, peterboroughpublichealth.ca slash rats uh, probably within the next few days. So please go there if you want to um, find that. And uh, Matt also provided some contact information if you wanted to chat further about anything he mentioned tonight. Thank you all so much. Have a good evening. Thanks. Thank you.